Good afternoon, everybody. Is this the right volume? Everybody can hear me all right? Okay, cool. So welcome to my talk about the Drupal 8 render pipeline. Um, my name is uh, Wim Leers. I work at Acquia in the office of the CTO. Um, and in the past one year and a half, approximately, I've been working on performance issues and uh, on criticals. And uh, in the end of 2014, um, we started looking at the render pipeline and the state of it, the understandability of it, and so on. And unfortunately, at the time, for understandable reasons, because Drupal 8 has changed a lot of things, but sadly, the state of the render pipeline was not that happy in the sense that it was very, very complex to understand. It took me full time, about a week, to understand. And I'm already working in core all the time. So that was not great, obviously. So we worked together and uh, came up with a path forward and make it actually understandable, clearer, um, less confusion and so on. And so at this point, the render pipeline is in a good state. And what I'm presenting here is a state that the pipeline has been in for the past several months. Um, so it is very likely that this is also the state that it will ship in. Um, maybe with some smaller changes, but in any case, this, should, this will be very, very close. Um, and so hopefully by the end of this talk, you will be able to understand the Drupal 8 render pipeline. It will not be scary anymore. Um, the diagram that I listed on the slide here that was uh, being shown while I was waiting for you guys to arrive, um, that is the diagram that we'll be using. And so that diagram shouldn't be scary anymore. So let's get started. So our guide is not sadly this hipster llama, but a diagram that looks slightly intimidating at first sight, which is this one. Um, but basically that diagram is just a map of Drupal 8, how it works at a high level, and it comes with driving instructions. That was uh, the thing on the right-hand side there, the column on the right-hand side. So in this talk, we're going to take a look at each of the areas of the map, just like a regular map, if you will. And at the end, you should have a pretty complete understanding and you should feel like uh, at a high level, you know how Drupal 8 works, how it renders pages, and so on. Um, so if you haven't yet already, please download the PDF and follow along, I would say. Um, I created this together with others to hopefully have that be a very useful reference while working in Drupal 8, uh, while debugging, while developing, while whenever. So if we remove the driving instructions for a second and just keep the actual map, um, then it looks like this, slightly less intimidating. And like any map, we need orientation points. So in the top left corner, we have a request that is coming in because the web is all about requests and answering those requests with responses. So from the top left, where we have the incoming requests, towards the bottom, where we have the response. So from top to bottom, we are processing the request and formulating a uh, response and then actually sending the response from left to right. We are at the very surface of Drupal and towards the right we are getting deeper into Drupal. And uh, the various areas that you could see, uh, roughly speaking, uh, are the ones that are here marked in blue rectangles. So those are the steps that we'll be looking at. Now I know that this talk is at um, the front end track and this may seem very back end y and you would not be wrong. <laughs> Um, but a front end is meaningless without a back end, right? A front end needs to talk to a back end to be able to show something meaningful, unless you're creating a static website, in which case you probably wouldn't be sitting here. Um, so I think that as a front end developer, it is useful to have a high level knowledge of how Drupal 8 works, how it serves responses, the things that you are working with. Um, but also, given the whole headless Drupal slash decoupled Drupal hype, um, it is useful to know which things Drupal is capable of doing, which kinds of transformations it can do, what kind of expectations you can have, uh, and maybe what kinds of responses that you as a front-end person would really like, but Drupal 8 isn't delivering. Well, hopefully this will give you the insight or, or the, the sufficient amount of knowledge, but not too much, to allow you to talk to developers and say, hey, I want my data in this kind of format, in this shape, make sure it happens, and uh, hopefully this will help you understand um, at a high level how that works, and that should hopefully help you as a front-end developer as well. So a quick show of hands, who would consider him or herself a front-end person in the room? And back-end preferred? Okay, so it's approximately 50-50, cool. Um, 
Okay, let's get started then. So the first step, and I think that everybody in this room already knows this, if you're a, or oh, actually one more, uh, is anybody of you more of a symphony person than a Drupal person? Yeah, okay, yeah, very few, but that's fine. Um, okay, so let's get started. Index.php, we've had this file for a long time, actually since forever in Drupal. And what it really is, uh, it, so we have had it for a long time, and what it is, it's a front controller. That's what Symfony calls it, that's the design pattern, and maybe the design pattern is a bit uh, over the top here, but basically all it is is it's a central point, a, a entry point where all requests are coming in through, and from there uh, we are deciding what to do and what response to send. Uh, by Symfony convention, this would be called app.php, not index.php, but basically the name is irrelevant, it's just a name, that doesn't matter. Um, so just for the Symphony people here. So the responsibilities are of that index of PHP thing, and uh, this may seem overwhelming at first maybe for some front-end people, but really it is high level, so no worries. Uh, Symphony uh, request objects, that's what Drupal 8 is using. So instead of talking to a global PHP object, global state is bad, so we in Symfony have this concept of a request object that encapsulates that so that we can pass it around and not mucking with global state. So we create a request object. The second thing we do in index.php is creating an HTTP kernel. And we'll talk a bit more about HTTP kernel later, but for the backend folks, uh, in the initialization, the creation of the HTTP kernel, what we do is we initialize a container and basically we read some settings from settings.php to know how to talk to the database, to talk to, talk to which database, um, and that's basically HTTP kernel. Next is, we, as a next step, we use both. So we give the HTTP kernel a request object, and the HTTP kernel will make sure that we get a response back. And I think that this, uh, this is, by the way, the key thing here, and this is really what the web is all about. You're sending requests, HTTP requests, and you're getting responses back. So at a high level, this is basically what Drupal is. You give a request, and you get back a response. And so this is what every single answer that Drupal provides, every single response, is thanks to this. Um, so once we have a response, we need to prepare it, maybe do some calculations, some rendering, depends on what kind of response you have, and as a next step, you send the response. That is making sure that the, that the thing you constructed actually makes it back to the end user. And finally, once the response is sent, it's possible to still do some final bits after the request has been sent, so things like logging or statistics. Um, but that's it. So basically, this is how Drupal works at a very, very high level. Uh, and this hopefully will be familiar to any Symfony developer because it's exactly the same in any Symfony application. So the next step, HTTP kernel handle. So remember that here we got a request, we gave it to the kernel, and we get back a response. So we're going to look in a bit more detail at the HTTP kernel, what it does. So what it is is basically an arbitrator. It decides what should happen in order to answer that request. HTTP kernel is really the heart of both Symfony and Drupal, and so it is used in unmodified shape, so the documentation that Symfony provides, so the one in the link there, um, is also applicable to Drupal. Um, so it should make for a more cross-project collaboration. So the responsibilities here are negotiation and routing, and that's happening during the request event, but more about events a bit later. So we need to negotiate a format to know whether we need to send a response in JSON, in HTML, in an image format, in PDF, whatever is uh, needed. And then routing, determining given that we have a certain format that we need to answer to, figuring out which code should actually generate that. And uh, for the, the, the backend developers in the room, in Drupal 8 we have routing.yaml files, uh, and there the underscore controller thing that determines which is the code that will be used to formulate a response. Once we know which controller should be used, uh, there is another event that allows for a last second overriding so that still something else could be uh, returned. And once we know for sure which controller is the one that will be used, uh, we need to provide that controller with the arguments it expects. So introspection is happening to figure out which arguments are needed and then make sure that the parameters are converted uh, to match that. So ex for example, node slash one. One means that node with ID one should be loaded. And if my controller expects a node object, then the node one URL will make sure that 
through a parameter conversion that one is converted to node object one. So basically just mapping those things, that's all this is about. Fancy words, but it's really simple. So given that we know which controller to call, given that we have the arguments, we can now finally call the controller, the thing that will formulate the response. And so that we'll, we'll be looking at in more detail later. And if the result of that controller, the, the return value, is a response object, because remember we have in Symfony that request object and as well as a response object. Um, so if the controller returns a response object, then we're all done. Basically, we have the entirety of information that we need to know what to send back to the end user, um, because the response object encapsulates all of that information. But if it was something else, so for example, if your controller returned an object or a render array, we need to still turn that into a response object, because as we saw in index.php, the only thing that, that knows how to deal with is response objects. So eventually we always need to get a response because again, that's what the web is all about. So in that case, um, there is the view event subscriber that allows you to turn whatever is returned by the controller into a response object. And then finally, we have the response event for last second modifying. And there are some good use cases out there, but the funniest one I've thought of yet is that every year there is Pirate Day, and on Pirate Day you want lots of YAR and fiddle DD on your website. Well, through a response uh, event subscriber, you could easily just inject that in several places if you want. So, um, basically this is the diagram directly from the Symfony documentation, and it's very similar. On the left-hand side, a request is coming in. On the right-hand side, right side, a response is coming out. And the blue boxes, the blue rectangles, are the events that are being triggered along the way. Purple things are where stuff is happening, if you will. And then the, pen, the most important bit, again, is uh, the controller there, where, the, caller, where the, the controller is called. If it's a response object that we get back, we go immediately to the right. If something else is returned, we go down below to the view event. But eventually, we always end up with a response event. And so really at a high level, this is all that Drupal is about and even all that Symfony is about, if you will. This is basically how every single thing that you see on a Drupal website eventually is working internally. And so the possibilities of this, uh, the HTTP kernel are also pretty interesting. So you have these various events that I mentioned um, and basically anything is possible with those. For example, the response event subscriber, the response event allows you to do things like the, the, the annual pirate day uh, inject fiddle DD stuff. Um, but for example, at the request uh, event subscriber, you could do some very early overriding and determine that based on some dynamic condition, you instead want to return a picture of a llama instead of an actual piece of content. I don't know what you want to do, but basically anything is possible. So hopefully that is all clear at a high level. So we've, we've dealt with the first two columns, if you will, and then the third one is the one we'll be talking about next. And those are events, and we, we've covered a few events already in the HTTP kernel. Um, so several, or if you will, most are triggered by the HTTP kernel. Um, and they're really the glue between Symfony and Drupal because remember that the first two columns, there is nothing Drupal specific in there yet. So the top layers are really just standard Symfony. And then with event handling, we are able to pull in the Drupal concepts and make Drupal work as, uh, in, in similar ways as it used to work in the past. So Drupal it can also, of course, trigger events and it does and we will see uh, one of those later on. But Remember, events are the, the glue between Symfony and Drupal. So the next step, uh, the controller. And this is the most interesting bit, um, even though it's the smallest rectangle, but this is the thing that most of you will be inter interacting with the most, at least backend developers, um, because this is basically the equivalent of the Drupal 7 page callback. So hook menu, you have a page callback. The equivalent in Drupal 8 is a controller. So it's just the application logic and it determines the content of your response. And it's already slightly alluded to, you can return different things from a controller. You can e return either a response object, a render array, which is the thing that we pretty much always return in Drupal 7 and you still can, as you can see, or an object. So um, in that case, we'll need an associated view event subscriber because remember, 
we always in the end need to return a response object. So it's keeping things simple and um, setting the same expectations always at a higher level. I will go in more detail into the render array later because that's still the most commonly used thing. So the possibilities here are uh, sending a response. If you return a response object from the controller, then you have full control over what is sent. So there is no more need for manual printing stuff and then calling exit, which was pretty commonplace sadly in Drupal 7, but there was also no other way, so it was acceptable. But now there is no more need for that. Everything is cleanly encapsulated. Returning a render array, then you basically let Drupal take care of sending, and we'll look more at that later. So Drupal will take care of turning it into a response object. Um, but now the really interesting thing, and where um, the first important tie into front end comes in, um, if your controller returns a object, meaning some, some kind of semantic data, then there can be many, multiple view subscribers that operate on that. So for example, if you have a tabular data object, some kind of spreadsheet-like data, um, the controller returns that kind of spreadsheet-like data, but then it can be rendered by one view subscriber into CSV, another into an HTML table, another into a PDF file, another into yet something else. And um, this is where things become really interesting because um, yes, headless Drupal may be good for some sites, but not for every use case it makes a whole lot of sense. For some things, Drupal, as it is today, as it works today, is just fine. And I think that we will be seeing quite a bit of headless Drupal, but I think there will be also combinations of both uh, parts that are headed and parts that are headless, if you will. And this kind of flexibility in what you return allows for those hybrids to exist because parts of the website, maybe if you're building a website for a library, let's say, then they will have a news section, a contact page and whatnot, and that could be regular Drupal. But then the parts that are more interactive, more dynamic, uh, like for example, browsing a library, uh, as in the books in the library and looking at the metadata about the books. Uh, well, in that case, maybe the controller should be returning a library book object, and that can then be rendered into a JSON response that is exactly in the format that the, the front end expects, or maybe an image for the, the front, uh, for the, the cover of the book, or maybe various shapes of JSON, it's really up to you. And uh, this also makes it then pretty easy to do things like integrating with external systems and making it pass through Drupal. So in the case of a library, for example, I can imagine that usually there are old, huge systems um, that collect, contain all of the book information, which ones are lent out and whatnot. Um, but then exposing that information to the visitors, to the users, is kind of difficult um, because they don't want to interact with old shady systems that are difficult to read and understand. So in that case, Drupal could talk to that external thing. The controller could return a semantic object called, for example, library book. And then there could be multiple view subscribers to return data in the various shapes, forms, formats that um, the front end expects. So the front end people could just ask the developers to add another view subscriber to return this particular shape of JSON um, or this particular shape of hell JSON or maybe something else completely. Like it, it, anything goes, you can do whatever you need and want. So I think the, 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 the possibility to return both due to force both the entire response to be something, which is option one, to be to have the return value be a render array, which is the classical thing, and which is how Drupal 8 still works for, for example, all of its UI. Or as a third case, uh, objects, semantical objects that are turned into various formats and shapes, um, that is then the other case. And the, the, the ability to use all three in one side, I think is very interesting and will open new doors. So if we look at the render array part in specific for a while, um, so render arrays as returned by controllers or page callbacks in Drupal 7 usually represent the main content, if you will. Usually there are blocks surrounding it, but then the render array that was returned by the controller is a thing centrally on the page. That's why we call it main content in Drupal 8 as well as in Drupal 7. And so as we were saying before, if the thing that the controller returns is something else than a response object, it has to be turned into a response object eventually. And this is a thing that turns render arrays into such response objects. 
Um, and what it does is selects and calls a main content renderer, and which main content renderer is used depends on the negotiated format. So if the negotiated format is HTML, we will use HTML main content renderer, and so on. And we'll look at that more in more detail next. Um, and another interesting possibility here is that a view subscriber could turn one of those semantic data objects still into a render array. Nothing prevents you from doing that. And then, because it's a render array and still not a response object, the main content view subscriber will kick in and turn that render array into HTML, for example. So um, you could do th something like the tabular data object thing that I mentioned earlier. Um, that could be turned into a type table or a theme table render array, and then Drupal would still take care of it the usual way. But that means that you have the flexibility of choosing how to format and render things on multiple levels, so you can do lots of interesting ways and reusing um, or, or even gradually shifting from um, the, the Drupal way of doing front end towards something else because your controllers are returning semantic data objects, if you will. Um, and then maybe at one stage they're, they're turning those into render arrays and then letting Drupal do the usual thing. Or you can do the JSON and JSON, hell JSON or whatever thing. So you have a lot of flexibility there. So looking at the main content renderers, um, these are the actual things responsible for turning a render array into a response uh, object. And the responsibilities are, uh, the basic ones that are supported in Drupal 8 core are HTML, obviously, uh, Ajax for Ajax responses. Remember those uh, dynamic loading things that Drupal 7 didn't use very often, but in some places does. That's the Ajax type. And Drupal 8 also has the ability to render any content into a dialog or a modal dialog. So those are supported as well. Um, now, this means that you could also add more main content renderers. So for example, PDF, uh, if you have a need for articles being printed or downloaded as PDF, then you could have a module that adds a PDF main content renderer, or maybe even something else, depends on your needs. You can add as many as you like. So taking a step back and looking at the big picture uh, at the diagram, um, this is what the entire thing looked like. And it may still look a little bit intimidating, but again, let's look at the orientation points. Top left, the request comes in. Bottom, end of request. Left to right, getting deeper into Drupal. If we flip it around a little bit, um, then we can see the various layers that the request passes through. So first there's index.php, which is symphony-like, if you will. So then there is the HTTP kernel, which is definitely Symfony. Then there is the glue between Symfony and Drupal, the events. Next, there is the controller, which is where your logic lives. And then depending on what the controller returns, um, so for example, let's say it returned a response object, then we skip five and six, and we go immediately to the bottom because we have a response, we can send it. If the controller returns something else, a render array or an object, then we still need to do some work. In case of an object, that's not listed here because I don't know which few subscribers you will have. But in case of a render array, it will go through five and then six. And then we have a response object and it will go to the end and send the response. So hopefully this makes it much clearer um, to give you a high level picture of how Drupal 8 processes requests. Now the most frequently used main content renderer is of course the HTML one because the web is all about HTML. So let's take a deeper look at that part. So the interesting thing here is, and it's new to Drupal 8, is that it supports page display variants, which sounds complex again, but it's just about alternative ways of rendering main content. Uh, and basically that just means alternative ways of filling the page.html.twig template. And examples there are the block module, which is about rendering the main content centrally, then rendering other blocks, whether they're pure decoration or in relation to the main content, no matter. Uh, but basically, blocks surrounding the main content. Panels has a different way of doing things, but that is another page display variant. Page manager is already ported to Drupal 8 and is already using this abstraction. Um, and so that is another example of uh, a way of filling the page of the HTML tweak template. So the default is a simple page variant, um, and that is basically just the main content and zero decoration. So you just get the title and the main content, and that's it. 
but of course the Drupal 8 standard profile still uses the block module. Um, and therefore the block page variant is still being used. So that's the main concept with blocks around it. So the responsibilities here are basically filling the regions of the page template and render that into a response. And it detects or it determines rather the, the page variant to use through an event, the select page display variant event. And then whichever one is selected, um, simple, block, page manager, something else, that one is built and then it's rendered. Now the interesting things here are that you can have panels, page managers, and other things without any hacks. And that also means that you don't need the very, very deep knowledge anymore that was necessary to be able to build panels and page manager in Drupal 7, because that was not easy at all. It was quite a daunting undertaking. And now it is just listening to an event, saying I want my thing to be used, not Drupal's stupid default thing, and then you have that be used, and that's all there is to it. So if, you, if, if one of you has maybe in a, a different opinion on how pages should be constructed or what the key elements of a page are and you've never liked blocks or you'd like to experiment with something else, that used to be very, very difficult, and now it really is a matter of probably 20 lines of code in total. So it opens the door for new paradigms maybe even, and maybe even something like a partially decapitated page variant, so a mix between headless Drupal and something that isn't, which still lets Drupal render the main content. But then instead of using something like blocks or panels, which are still conceptually relatively similar, uh, instead you rendered block-like things, but using JS, using React.js, Angular, whatever uh, you prefer, client-side client -side caching and local storage, and that allows you then to render more dynamic or interactive alternatives to blocks, such as, for example, showing live statistics like that are updated while you're looking at the page of how many people are looking at it, um, live commenting that shows up right away, anything you want, any fancy things, um, anything becomes possible that you are that you have come to expect maybe of the the more modern JS rich um, frameworks. So as you can see, you can, very, you, can, you can create very interesting new combinations that would have been very, very painful to do in the past. Um, so hopefully that will help you with some interesting experiments. And so finally, a little bit more about render arrays. Um, render arrays are still very much the same, but they are improved in many ways. Um, and so I will cover some of the high level points in this in these slides, but not the details. For those, I have other uh, documentation pages on Drupal.org and talks. So first, assets. In Drupal 7, what we were doing, and this is very much relevant to, to front end as well, what we were basically doing was always load jQuery.js and Drupal.js, even if nothing on that page was using it. And uh, as we all know, loading JS comes not without a cost, parsing it also and executing it definitely. So we were blocking, we were delaying showing the page because we were loading that, Jeff, that JavaScript, even though we were maybe not even using it. So in Drupal 8, what, you, what we have is dependencies between assets. So we make sure that, the, that we only load those assets, CSS or JavaScript, that are actually being used on that page. So in, in Drupal 8, we have the concept of asset libraries, where you declare which CSS and JS logically be belong together, which kind of form a logical unit, which are a component in some lingo, um, a, forget the word, basically reusable components of CSS and JavaScript that work together and that uh, support a semantical piece of content. And then the, the ability to declare that that CSS and JavaScript also expects, for example, to, that jQuery is present on the page, or jQuery once, or something else. You can declare your dependencies, and that allows Drupal to only load those things that are actually necessary. The next one is cache tags. Uh, so some of you may have heard that Drupal 8 now ships with uh, page caching enabled by default for anonymous users. And the reason that we didn't do that in Drupal 7 was that we wouldn't have been able to reliably invalidate cached pages. So basically, what we did was, whenever any node was updated, whenever any comment was posted, we cleared 
the entire cache. So we had to rebuild every single thing, and that's why it wasn't enabled by default. But the reason it worked that way was because it couldn't have worked in any other way. The APIs were lacking. And this is where cache tags come in, because the, the problem was how to clear all cache items containing something, the title, the body field, whatever, from Node42, the answer was it's impossible to know. And that's where cache tags come in. So cache tags declare this render rate, this piece of markup, depends on this data in Drupal. So when that data changes, please invalidate me also, so that I'm always up to date. That's basically what cache tags are. Cache contacts are related but different. Um, they are about the variation. So the question is, does the representation of the thing I'm rendering vary per permissions, per URL, per interface language, per something? Um, the answer is cache contacts, and they're very similar to the HTTP very header, if you know that one. Um, so a concrete example at the bottom, I'm not sure if it's legible in the back, but uh, the comment says associate the user dot permissions cache context with the render array. And then the logic says, if the current user has the permission pet llamas, this is for a zoo site, a petting zoo site. Um, and the markup is then, how many llamas will you pet today? Question mark. Um, so that, that content is only shown if the user has the permission to pet llamas. And how do we make sure that then if I have permission to pet llamas, but somebody else doesn't, how do we make sure that we get to see different content? That's where cache contacts come in. We say that the content varies depending on the permissions, and that then makes sure that we don't show the wrong content, possibly sensitive content, to the wrong user. And then bubbling. Uh, this is where the things come together. So we had assets, we had cache tags, and we had cache contexts. And all of those things really affect the, the overall HTML, because, for example, if my fancy form needs certain assets, maybe some JavaScript to make things more uh, usable, uh, some CSS to make it look nicer, then we cannot really load that CSS and that JavaScript within the HTML for that form. We have to load it at the level of the HTML itself. Similarly, if uh, my cache tags for a field, for example, so here, for example, I'm looking at a field for a node, and I'm showing the current user, like the author, for example. So the author is being shown, so it is tagged with user2. This is just a um, representation to make it um, easier to explain. This is obviously not actual HTML that Drupal renders. Um, so the node that I'm rendering, when that is rendered, it contains the fields. So it actually also depends on the things that the field depends on. So for example, my node shows the body field as well as the author. That means that the node, which is rendered, also depends on the user not having a changed name in the meantime. So I'm tagging it with the user. And so the cache text for the field bubble up to the node level. But when rendering the block that the, it is containing the node, that block actually also depends on everything it contains. So that, that's where bubbling comes in, and it works just like JavaScript events. So basically just deeper in the tree, everything deeper in the tree bubbles up to a higher level, to a yet higher level, to a yet higher level, to, till we eventually get to the HTML level. And that is how we make sure that we know with absolute certainty and with complete uh, with complete knowledge of, of uh, everything that is on the page, which assets we need to load, which things it depends upon, and by what things it should vary. And this is how we can make sure that Drupal 8 is actually fast and faster than Drupal 7 in many cases. And even beyond HTML, we can bubble that, this is really for the backend people, we can even bubble that to the response level, so to a new level, uh, to a new header called the xDrupal cache text header, and that allows us to know with absolute certainty that we can invalidate all responses that contain something from node 5 whenever we modify node 5. So we can purge all of our varnish instances all over the world instantly and have that content appear instantly and not invalidate anything else. So render caching, that's where all of these things come together really. Uh, this is basically fragment caching, is what it's called in many other places. This allows us to, to cache expensive, complex portions of the page. For example, a node can be quite complex. Maybe it contains many fields and whatnot. Um, that is expensive to gather all that information and then call all the templates to put them all in the right order and structure. This is where render caching comes in and it uses all of the previous things to make sure that we can cache correctly and invalidate correctly and so on. 
Um, and if you're interested, this is where the intersection between front end and back end definitely is very present. Um, these things, cache tags, contacts, and assets, they're all present and they're all very uh, understandable once you've uh, started to use them. But it would be great if we could visualize it while developing so that you could see, oh, this portion of the page actually depends on these assets. And that's also very valuable for front-end people to make sure that they haven't associated the wrong assets, CSS and JavaScript, with uh, something that actually doesn't need it, but then forgot, forgot to add it to the one that does need it. So I've, um, I've created a prototype, a, a very, very early prototype of visualizing that tree of information and how it all bubbles up so you can see where the associated assets are coming from and where the cache tags are coming from and so on. So I'm not a great front-end developer, so it would be great if somebody is also very interested and passionate about this. This is using CSS 3D and CSS transition, so the fanciest stuff around. Um, so if you're interested, please ping me. And so that's all I've had. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please shoot. Um, it is very much supported by the render pipeline, but at this stage, not yet by blocks, for example. The problem is that we don't have a solid enough way to, d to know which things a block depends upon. So maybe a block is shown that depends on the node, because a block is showing, for example, the file attachments to that node, but then the block needs to be aware about which node is being shown, and that kind of interaction, knowing those dependencies, knowing that it depends on that node that is being shown, that is where the current problem lies. But in general, yes, the render pipeline completely supports that. It's just that, for example, for blocks, that is where it's still a bit hairy and unclear if that will actually happen. But work is being done right now to make that happen. Um, so, the markup that I was showing you, I think you're specifically referring to this, possibly? Yeah. So this is just a, um, um, a way of conveying how it works, but you have to imagine that each of those tags are actually render arrays, nested render arrays. So a tree of arrays, which is what Drupal has always used, to represent which things should be rendered. And so, besides markup and maybe declaring which theme function, or rather which template to use. There is also a pound cache thing, which contains that metadata, and pound attached for assets. Okay, can you repeat the final sentence? Uh, fields and entities, yes, absolutely, that works perfectly fine. But as I said, the problem with blocks is that m many, or at least a bunch of them, depend on some things on the page, and that is where it's, hairy, uh, where it's hairy. But if you have blocks that are self-contained, then yes, absolutely.
to book a page alter that we have in Drupal 7. And I kind of think of book page alter as a, as a book of last resort. Like you can use it, you can do all kinds of powerful things with it, but it's probably a last resort option. Do you think on a, on a typical Drupal 8 site build, do you think people will be implementing lots of new event subscribers? Or is that a last resort tool, or is it something for a module like page manager to implement and then as a site builder you want your guest to come to it? <laughs> Interesting question. I, I like the analogy to hook page alter. Um, but are, are you sure that you're referring to the view event subscriber and not the response? I am not sure. Okay. <laughs> so were, were you asking about the pirate example, the R-Harder one? I think I'm, I'm asking about that. Yeah. yeah, okay. No, definitely there won't be a whole lot of those. That's why I gave the kind of silly example of uh, the, the pi talk as a pirate day uh, annually. Um, so no, I wouldn't expect there to be many. Currently there is one in core that is used only in one special case. Um, so no, there there wouldn't and shouldn't be many, but maybe as a way of quickly hacking things, like you, you could even do very, very nasty things like replacing a certain class that you dislike as a front-end person and then just do a string replace and replace all of them in your HTML source. It's possible, but no, I wouldn't expect there to be a whole lot. Uh, it should be indeed for, for very special cases or it, as a last resort probably. All right, looks like there are no more questions. Thank you very much. Hope you liked it.